Hello, everybody, and welcome to Experience TV, a live show about the economic revolution that we are all living through right now, the experience economy. Brands are now competing on the quality of their customer experiences, and that's what this show is all about. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm your host, Katie Martel. Please say hello if you're watching this live. I'm monitoring LinkedIn right now. Uh, and if you, you can also, by the way, use that chat to please ask questions, which you're going to want to for my special guest today. Um, and hello if you are watching this in the future at smartercx.com. Uh, a reminder that this show is sponsored by Oracle Customer Experience, which helps organizations build lasting customer relationships by making every interaction matter. Uh, and you can also watch all the shows in this series, a recap of everyone, including this show, with links to all of the resources that I'm going to mention today and my guest at smartercx.com slash experience TV. So thank you to Oracle for making this show possible. And let me be the first to remind you, if you've not heard already, submissions for the 15th annual Markey Awards are open. Open. They are actively happening. Did you submit yet? It's a decade and a half that this awards program has recognized excellence in marketing, sales, service, and commerce. Nominations are due March 26th. March 26th. Put it in the calendar. Don't miss your chance to be recognized for the great work that you did in 2020. Listen, this week we're talking about loyalty marketing and loyalty marketing programs. As brands in every industry face more competition than ever, customer loyalty is becoming harder and harder to earn and to keep. This means brands have to think out of the box when it comes to engaging customers and keeping them coming back. So, Today's topic is going to dig into how we can leverage programs, membership experiences, loyalty programs, everything from points to rewards, memberships, free stuff, discounts, birthday tweets, I mean, or treats. Listen, what is your favorite? Everyone has like their favorite membership program. Mine is, I'll be very honest, Starbucks. Starbucks Rewards has like 17 million members. I am a very happy reward member. Uh, let me know in the comments what you love. Maybe you're an Amazon Prime member. They've got like 100 million members. Sephora Beauty Insider, they've got 17 million. And by the way, Sephora's Beauty Insiders make up like 80% of their annual sales. So that's a very engaged, very loyal customer base. North Face, you might be part of their program. They're called the VI Peak program. Get it? North Face, VI Peak. It's cute. Um, but listen, tell me what your favorite is throughout the broadcast, um, and you might win a special prize of absolutely nothing. Um, listen, today coming up, my special guest is Clay Walton House, Managing Director at PK Global. And I got to say, he knows more than anyone on this topic, so I really should just let him take it away. Um, but please do stick around, because I'm going to be asking him what great loyalty programs need right now and what role they play in the chaos that is 2021 in our marketing plans. So why loyalty? Why are we talking about this right now? What's happening? Loyalty programs are more popular than ever. There's a resource from Oracle. I'm going to drop the link in the comments here in the chat on LinkedIn. It's called Marketer's Guide to Brand Loyalty. And it features some research that illustrates what's going on right now. 71% of consumers are active in between one to five loyalty programs every single month. That's a vast majority. 56% have at least one loyalty program app on their phone like I do with my Starbucks app that I probably use too much. Um, and 68% redeem rewards at least once a quarter. This is happening. This is happening in real time. And these programs are more popular than ever. There are a few loyalty programs that I think made some very notable changes in 2020 that uh, I would really love to just call attention to. Hold on one sec while I get this other graphic off screen. Sorry, hold on, hold on. Uh, and one is uh, with with Lego. So Lego has this great VIP uh, initiative. It's the loyal. It actually, by the way, is an award winning program that won a loyalty 360 platinum award. It was a recently relaunched, rejiggered program. And uh, what's really great about it is that Lego operated with this program under the uh, the principle of inclusivity, right? Rather than focus on passive rewards for only their high spenders, this beloved toy brand proactively rewards experiences across several different buyer types and, and, and price points. I want to quote Jessica, uh, Jessica Kaufman of Oracle, who put this resource together, um, who quotes, with so many ways to earn and redeem, Everyone can have an experience that makes them feel like a VIP. I think that's a very extraordinary way to look at these reward experiences. There's another program, and I'm sure many of you on this call, I know that uh, many in my family are members of this, the Disney Movie Insiders Program. This is the loyalty program for Walt Disney Studios, which spans everything from Marvel to Star Wars to Pixar. Now, the program made a few changes uh, last year to adapt to the way the consumers switched 
to home viewing, right? Now ensure that members can get rewarded for all purchases, no matter where it's made or how movies are being watched. But what I really love about their program is how it captures data data to deliver a better customer experience. What they do on the back end is they build these progressive member profiles that incorporate things like household makeup, movie interests, viewing preferences, and more. Um, but don't take, I feel like LeVar Burton, don't take my word for it, right? There's, um, there's absolutely a, a, a fantastic interview with Ruth Walker, who's the vice president of CRM at the Walt Disney Studios, um, who recently sat down during the Oracle Live event. I'm going to play you a clip from that, and I'm going to link to the full interview. If this is something you're interested in, go listen to Ruth talk about uh, her experience at Disney. So I'll play this quick clip. Uh, from Ruth, again, the vice president of CRM at the Walt Disney Studios, talking about this this progressive profiling through uh, customer data. One sec. Check it out. I think, you know, we're really excited about learning to learn deeper about our customers. Uh, typically at the studio, we've looked at that more as franchise affinity. So Marvel, Star Wars, Pixar. Um, however, I'm really excited about going even deeper and learning more about our members uh, in terms of their need states and why they buy movie tickets and when they buy movie tickets, because that's really going to allow us to be more personalized in our communications with them and also the kinds of offers that we feel at an individual level a member is going to like. Well, you know, data is the thing that enables us to be completely relevant with each one of our customers. I think that's the best quote of the whole thing. Data is the thing that enables us to be completely relevant with each of our customers. And if you look at the larger crackdown on cookies that's been happening across the industry, right, and the third party data that is increasingly a scarce resource, what's happening in marketing is that loyalty programs are becoming a great resource of first party customer data. Clay, I'm going to ask you all about that in my green room here. So make sure that you're paying attention there. Um, but I just want to comment on one more thing. Ruth explains when she does her intro for that interview, um, Ruth describes her job, which again, VP of CRM like this. I think this is great. She says, we fuel our members' passion and excitement for all things Disney movies. We do that with engagement, access, and reward opportunities. That to me encapsulates the mindset of a loyalty marketing professional. We fuel our members' passion and excitement for all things Disney. I think it's great. And listen, I gotta comment, I gotta show you one more loyalty program. And this is personal now because I just bought a Vitamix, you guys. I got it for my birthday a couple of weeks ago. It is a game changer. So shout out to Vitamix. If you'd like to sponsor me, I am more than happy to be part of that program because I am obsessed with what this thing can do. Vitamix has a, a kind of a newer loyalty program uh, and it's 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 great. Um, it's a free loyalty program for customers like me. We can earn points if we register the product, upload receipts from wholesalers or engage with exclusive content. Now this is cool. Last year, right, pandemic is happening. What kind of content do members want? Vitamix launched a content initiative that was not focused on sales messaging, but on healthy eating, helping customers incorporate whole foods into their diet, of course, using their Vitamix. They even released a recipe for at-home sanitizer, hand sanitizer. All you need is isopropyl alcohol, vegetable glycerin, hydrogen peroxide, and some optional essential oils. Delicious. Um, what's really delicious, though, are the results of the program. They saw a 31% greater average net order value for members compared to non-members. Um, and it was also a big goal of theirs to capture more registrations, again, to get more of that first party data, um, to really understand the customers who are buying at retail. Since going live, the program has seen a 30% increase in product registrations. I'll drop a link to the full interview with Sarah Herman, who's the manager of D2C Marketing at Vitamix. Um, and I just think it's a fantastic program that I'm really excited to be part of. Listen, uh, I'm going to be uh, right back after this with my very special guest, um, because at this point, really, Clay is going to illustrate uh, the secrets of customer loyalty, what he sees happening, and some special advice for everyone uh, who is trying to navigate these programs today. So after a very short break, I'll be right back with Clay. Do not go anywhere. Be right back. All right, my friends. Clay, we should be live. Hello, 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 and welcome to the broadcast. Hey, Katie. Good to be here. Clay, what do you think about all the uh, amazing loyalty programs I've already shared today? Well, you definitely hit on a couple of my favorites. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the Disney program in particular. I'm sure we could spend some time talking about that one. 
But, you know, one thing really piqued my interest at the very end of your segment there, which was uh, mentioning the title of the leader at Vitamix who's leading the loyalty initiative, you know, leader of DTC marketing. And I think that actually provides a bit of a lens on today's conversation around how membership and loyalty is part of a much bigger picture in driving customer relationships. Well, talk to me about that. And, and first and foremost, before we jump into that, tell folks who don't know about PK, which, by the way, you call yourselves experience engineers. I love that. Tell us about the firm and, and, and your role there. Yeah, absolutely. So PK is a digital services firm. Uh, we really pride ourselves on being you know, a firm that's known for working with companies who aspire to be customer obsessed themselves. So a lot of what we do is really bringing research and data science and insights about uh, brands audiences to clients and, and helping them design and build uh, leading customer experiences. So loyalty uh, is a key focus area for us. It's a space I've spent uh, my career in and a big part of what we do. I think it's also uh, increasingly a more critical part, right, of your, to your point, this holistic approach to customer engagement, customer experience. So let's start right there. Tell me about the role of loyalty now that we're living in a world of uh, a pandemic, a lot of churn happening in our databases, a lot of category switching happening, e-commerce. I mean, loyalty to me feels like it's more important than ever. Absolutely. I mean, I think even before the pandemic, there was a pretty fundamental shift occurring in the loyalty space. You know, the old school model of loyalty programs and rewards programs was already, I think, changing pretty rapidly. And now what we see today and the reason we talk about membership uh, through this more holistic lens on the loyalty space is that we're seeing value provided to members in a number of different formats, right? That could be exclusive content or access to communities, or it could be services that are value added and are member exclusive. There's really a whole host of different things brands are now designing into a member experience. And that's really the big reason why we see these programs playing such a strategic role in this broader DTC landscape and, and what brands are doing to try to stay relevant. And in terms of, of what consumers want, I'm actually going to really quick quote. Um, I read a study from, from Merkel that was talking about what people hate <laughs> about loyalty programs. I'd love to bring that up real quick. I'm just going to cover your face with a graph for just 30 seconds. Um, but there was a great survey that was done, and they found that the, the kind of number one complaint consumers have when it comes to rewards is that it takes too long, right? It's too difficult to redeem or rewards are just not valuable. So, you know, with that in mind, tell us what consumers are looking for from those experiences. Absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, the reality is rewards in the classic sense, they have a role to play. There are certain segments of your audience who certainly do value them and it will drive uh, many healthy behaviors in terms of customer engagement, retention and loyalty. But some of those issues that you raised are spot on, uh, and we see that borne out in research as well, in terms of some of the reasons customers are frustrated with the value they get from rewards in the traditional sense. So for us, that really points to the imperative around thinking much more holistically around value and other ways of delivering it beyond rewards, right? Uh, that digital relationship, uh, the services I mentioned earlier, uh, and really finding something that is truly brand unique and value added to your audience. That's so interesting. I always think about, you know, if, if branding is a promise and the promise is what you deliver through customer experience, it makes sense that your loyalty program should also be differentiated, just like your brand, your value prop, all of that. Um, let me ask you this, who's doing it differently? Who's got a really unique kind of creative way of how they deliver that value to members? Okay, Katie, so if you wanna talk about a brand who is truly using membership to make the brand promise manifest, I think you have to look at Nike, right? The Nike Plus program has really been, you know, what, what they would consider, uh, what Nike would consider a key enabler to what they've called their direct consumer offense, right? So when you take a look at Nike's business over the last few years, what they've done is made massive investments in investing in their owned and operated channels and the experiences that they can deliver to their customers, trying to make what is a very large global audience more addressable in terms of direct marketable relationships. 
And Nike Plus, their membership program doesn't have points. It's, it's not a traditional points-based program, but it is all about the idea of everyone's an athlete, right? And the, the inspiration and the, and the brand promise, as you said, that Nike provides. So examples of what they do, which I really think are creative and a best-in-class best example of membership done right, there's access to things like virtual coaching sessions through a partner network. There is access to things like class pass to attend local uh, fitness classes. There's access to educational resources around nutrition uh, and, and fitness activities. And then there's a whole digital ecosystem of apps that Nike has developed all of which members can access and utilize that provide functional value, whether you're a member of the Nike Run Club, or if you want access to sneakers that drop early if you're a sneakerhead and you, and you download the sneakers app. So really what they've done is they've built an ecosystem of member services and experiences that truly are the Nike brand manifest. And I think that's super fascinating as you reflect on the broader opportunity for how membership models can evolve in the space. It seems like an evolution from, you know, reward-based spend to get programs. Um, that program, can I ask, how long has it been in development? This sounds like a very complicated yet robust system. How long has that been in place? I think it's been about, uh, three or four years now. And like most brands, you know, there's a pilot phase. So yeah. Nike really did some interesting things around connecting the omni-channel experience, starting with some stores, some flagship stores in New York. So there was a pilot store in Soho uh, where a bunch of member experiences were provided in that physical retail store, had to be a member to access them, but really uh, fun and interesting things that only Nike can unlock for their members. So, you know, it's been an evolution for them, and that's certainly something we, we can talk about a bit later uh, in our discussion around best practices and thinking about membership as a product and driving a backlog or a transformation roadmap around that product. And Nike is a good example of, of that and that Nike Plus has evolved significantly over the years um, in, in an iterative fashion. Membership as product is really, really interesting. Um, I think of content as product and I'm always saying it, it's got to deliver value. It's got to be differentiated right. just like a good product does. So is this the future of, of where memberships are going? Are, are more brands looking towards this North Star that Nike Plus embodies? I think so. I think when you look at a Amazon Prime, for example, um, you know, this is an organization that has um, you know, entire orga entire teams, large teams devoted exclusively to the evolution of that that program. Now, this is kind of a hot topic uh, in the loyalty space. Some would debate, oh, well, that's a subscription. It's not a loyalty program. Interesting academic argument to be had. My 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 point of view on that is always: Does it inspire loyalty? Does it drive increased engagement? Does it drive lifetime value? Does it help address churn and increase retention? If you answer yes to those questions, it's a loyalty program. Now you can call it whatever you want, but you have to be a member to access those benefits, and those benefits of membership inspire loyalty. And so uh, Amazon Prime or Starbucks Rewards are two examples of programs like Nike uh, that have regularly evolved the offering of membership and done so with an eye toward how it serves their broader DTC business. Talk to me then about the kind of exchange that happens. You provide a ton of value on one end, whether it's two day free shipping or you know my double stars. I really love the Starbucks app. Can you tell, by the way, I'm obsessed with it. It's just great. Um, but on the other end, the consumer has to give up some data, right? And this is, I mentioned kind of the big opportunity as we are moving away from a kind of a cookie, you know, less world. First party data can really be collected through these programs. I mentioned the Disney example, building progressive profiles. How are membership programs like this kind of serving the brands themselves who need this insight? And my big question is, what do they have to give to the consumer in that equal exchange? Yeah, I mean, I think that what we've seen over the years with both the success of these programs in terms of their reach and, and the volume of members that they're able to attract, and you were rattling off some really great statistics on that earlier, 
the, the reality is the research has, has borne out that most people are willing to exchange that information to become marketable, if you will, uh, when they know that there's value on the other side of that exchange. And so the implicit uh, imperative for brands is, can you create a value proposition around membership that does have that broad appeal that is rich enough to attract these customers who are willing to enter into a direct relationship with you and how do you make sure that's designed in a way that, you know, of increasing importance is thinking about the diversity of audiences you serve, right? And how their needs, you heard Ruth Walker at Disney talking about it, understanding need states. How do you design, design a program that not only helps you attract attracts different kinds of audiences, but then once they are a member, use, use membership to understand them better. Why do they interact with the brand the way they do? I think getting at the why is a huge opportunity for many brands, not just using data to describe what has happened or even predict what might happen, but understand and explain why. That's a real unlock for brands that still is very aspirational for most. The last thing I would say on this topic, Katie, is you know, you hit, you hit the nail on the head when you talked about this shifting data landscape in terms of privacy and GDPR and CCPA. And the reality is that as marketers are facing some threats in terms of the data they have at their disposal, membership is one of the only ways to mitigate that risk, right? And so having a reason for people to become known, to become marketable, to enroll in a membership program, and then using membership to get information from your audience and help them tell you what they want, what they need, why they interact with you. That's a real aha for a lot of brands um, in this journey. That that data collection, I agree. It, it strikes me as the kind of only way forward, right? For these programs to really live up to the promise of being relevant and personalized, right? But it does require that you know, one single view of the customer. We always love to, to hear from my friends at Oracle, right? Uh, on the back end. And I, I, I agree that it's it's the aspirational state of getting to that why, not the what, but the why. How, how are brands, let me, let me put you right on the spot, getting to the why within these programs? Is it survey-based, right? Is it just kind of taking a pulse check of well, why are you here? You know, why did you purchase? How is that happening? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think this is a space where we've seen some pretty significant changes in methodology over the last few years. I think the reality is that understanding the why almost always requires data outside your first party ecosystem, right? Because as I had said earlier, the explanatory power of first party data is often lim limited. It can, it can tell you what people did. It can even predict what they might do next based on probabilities, but it's very difficult to ascertain why. And so you, you hit the nail on the head. You covered one key area of data that is a missing piece to that puzzle, which is how do you use, you know, quantitative studies um, at scale research um, survey based methods to get data that you can append and, and do lookalike modeling, for example, to help understand the why. And then the other aspect is what I mentioned around customer provided or, you know, what you might hear Forrester calling zero party data and membership models like Disney that Ruth Walker was talking about are starting to give the member tools to answer questions that are far more emotive and are far more uh, colorful and insightful in terms of helping understand the why. You might ask people about inspirations or desires or their needs. You might ask them about their lifestyle. You might ask them about how their family has needs related to the brand. All of that might help explain the observable behavior that you can track and interpret in first party data. So I do see this as being you know, a really interesting space where there's a lot of innovation that is possible, yet many brands um, you know, haven't gotten there yet, which is understandable. Yeah, we ha we always have to give them, uh, you know, the gap, right? Room to grow, and and I think this is exciting. To me, this is a, a a great promise of what all marketers and all brand leaders want, right? Which is to create that emotional connection and build trust with buyers. I, I think this is kind of classic and timeless in a sense, as well as it is a kind of cutting edge. I hadn't actually heard zero uh, <laughs> zero party. What is the difference between first party and zero party? If anyone like me is like 
what the heck is the difference? Well, you know, everybody in marketing loves a buzzword. Right? <laughs> right. So, uh, this is just another one of the new ones. So uh, I believe Forrester is calling zero party data customer provided data. So, you know, first party is data that we can observe via a customer's interaction with the brand. So it could be engagement data on a website or a mobile app or transaction data or preferences that are set by a customer in a preference center. But in this case, what we're really talking about is, you know, creating ways like a preference center or polling or quizzes or other Q&A tools or surveys that are delivered programmatically through tools. Uh, other ways of getting customers to answer questions that we would not otherwise be able to answer via the, the first party data. That does make sense. And I will always just have so much respect for analysts. That is their job to name things year after year, right? Come out with something new. So zero party data. Now we all know. Thank you for that explanation. Um, can we quickly touch on B2B? I think that loyalty programs are just put in the bucket of direct to consumer and consumer brands when there's a huge opportunity to look at them in the world of B2B. Um, yeah. Tell me what's happening there. What do they look like in a business to business relationship and who's doing it well? Yeah. It's a really interesting question. And I, I think there's a couple different models that we see in the space and that we've done some work around. You know, one would be a more traditional uh, B2B model that might look a bit more like a sales incentives program or enabling a, a partner. So take a high tech company like a Microsoft or an Adobe uh, who has a partner ecosystem, right? They may develop a program that offers escalating levels of value to partners based on the partner's value back to the tech company. Now, that sounds a lot like tiering in a loyalty program, doesn't it? It sounds a lot like elevated levels of value that you unlock through interaction and performance, right? So that's one flavor of, of loyalty programs in the B2B space is more of a, uh, could be a sales network that you're designing a program for, uh, but you're really focused on traditionally more business oriented value drivers for that audience and structuring a program in a way that leads them up a ladder, if you will, in terms of their value back to the brand or the business. The other flavor we see actually follows a bit more of the consumer model. So I'll use an example from uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific, which for those of you don't, who don't know them, they're one of the largest life sciences companies in the world. They make a lot of products you probably uh, would be surprised to know that you may use in your own home, like Nalgene's if you use those water bottles. Uh, but they also provide lab equipment and um, a whole bunch of laboratory supplies to biotech companies, research institutions, et cetera. Traditionally, they've sold through a traditional B2B model where they look at all of their accounts as an account and they sell to somebody who is a buyer at that account. Uh, but now what they've been doing is developing more of a B2B2C loyalty strategy focused on lab scientists. And so Thermo Fisher is developing benefits and value added experiences for the lab researchers themselves, trying to build a direct brand relationship and offer value to those researchers such that it, it accrues to increasing value of those individual accounts. So that's the other flavor of, of model that we see in the B2B space. Both are really interesting and um, lots of evolution there. And it really follows the same mindset that you shared earlier, this idea that you're trying to increase addressable audience and create these connections with, with individuals. I, think, I, I get it. I love it. Thank you. I think B2B, is it fair to say, has the most um, opportunity right, to, to improve and to leverage more of these types of programs? I think so. I think that when we talk about customer centricity and we sort of unpack that buzzword a little bit, <laughs> I think what a lot of B2B companies are perhaps lagging consumer uh, industries in is really understanding people as human beings. And there's a tendency to look at B2B business through an account lens. And, and that leads to less of a human focus, less of a truly customer centric understanding of, of your audience, why people buy, why people use your product and what might make them more loyal. This is fascinating. My last show was all about account-based marketing. And uh, you know, there's a shift to move away from lead-based marketing to account. And right. I think that the nuance here is what I appreciate about this kind of era of modern marketing. It, there's never a silver bullet. It's always, it's never one all in one or another. 
this is about mixing strategies. And I, I, I really appreciate your comments about the role of loyalty programs, even in B2B, with just customer relationships and ensuring that they are based in human emotional connections. It's fascinating. Um, and so I have to ask then, knowing all this, I'm sure there's there's marketers watching going, okay, what does this mean for me? What do I do now? Um, you've got these wonderful five loyal truths as part of PK that I just found very helpful. Um, and happy to have you share those or any other tips you have for what you're seeing work and what you think the most priority, highest priority should be uh, in 2021, this kind of weird era that we're in right now. Yeah. Happy to. Uh, and I'll maybe just rattle off a few of those. So I, I think first and foremost, this conversation that we've been having around the role of data and research and loyalty programs and membership and understanding your audience and trying to unpack the why. I, I think that the reality is to act on the idea of customer centricity, it always has to start with an understanding of who your audience is. And so I have to come back to that as, as sort of the first truth, if you will, is that, you know, the, the customer centric insights that need to inform this kind of work in terms of the design of an effective loyalty program or the experience you want to deliver through membership really has to be grounded in what does drive behavior, what does drive emotional response for your target audience. The second thing I would probably point to is the idea that just as you pointed out in the B2B example, where both ABM, account-based marketing, you know, and loyalty program strategies might be very relevant to a given B2B business, same is true for loyalty in the sense that you have to get outside that traditional kind of four-walled box of what a loyalty program or rewards program is. You must think more holistically about an omni-channel member experience. And you also need to think about organizational capabilities and disciplines that are required to execute on these programs in a market leading way. And so what that means is thinking about things like what are the organizational um, you know, uh, capabilities and skills around customer intelligence, you know, using data and research to really understand the audience. What are the skills around digital delivery? You know, is your, is your organization set up to deliver digital experiences at scale quickly? Uh, or are you still structured in a legacy industry business model that makes that difficult due to functional silos? Um, there are many examples of, of disciplines that are important for this kind of work, but you've got to be thinking about those being key to the strategy as well. I really think that uh, what I've learned, we had a prep call where I was just taking frantic notes because to me, loyalty programs have always existed in that box, right? The opportunities that now exist with what you're talking about, the omni-channel experience, the amount of data that we're collecting, the types of data, it's really creating these kind of, I think, a blank canvas, right, for, for loyalty programs. Um, I'm going to put you right on the spot, and I didn't ask you to prepare this, but I want to hear... What is your favorite membership program that you personally are part of that lives up to some of these, um, you know, truths that you're describing that you feel understood, that you feel appreciated as a customer, you feel that the content, the services, the value that you're receiving is relevant. Um, it's omni-channel, cross-platform. Who's doing it really well today? And I'm absolutely putting you on the spot. It's what's in your wallet question <laughs> right now. I love it. I love it. So, you know, the caveat I'll give you here before I, I share my answer is... Not surprisingly, this is a very emotional answer, right? So this is a, maybe a bit less about, you know, all the mechanics that you and I have been discussing on this call, a bit more about what is a program or what is a membership experience that really unlocks something for me of, of meaningful value and builds a relationship with the brand that I have a true affinity and appreciation for. And that brand is REI. If you, know, if you know the outdoor retailer REI, they've made some major investments in how they think about membership and delivering value to their members in a more holistic way. And that includes things like travel services, that includes things like value-added content, that in includes things like uh, uh, equipment rentals and trade-ins, um, and now increasingly, entering the re-commerce space and allowing people to trade back in uh, even, even clothing that's been lightly worn. 
And so they really look at membership, which is a one-time $30, I believe. Don't, don't quote me on that. I believe it's a lifetime membership for $30. Um, once you're a member, you have access to all of these really rich uh, experiences uh, and, and services that are all about helping people get outdoors and enjoy themselves. And I think that it's a great example that is all about these things we've been discussing, 100% brand aligned and very value added. It, it strikes me as uh, fascinating that that's the example you gave, given that REI is always considered its, its you know membership experience as a co-op, a, a true shared collaborative part of the, the customer is considered very much part of the business, the business model as anything else. What a fantastic North Star to share, um, another value-driven company and one that is kind of increasingly setting the, the bar very high for brands. Um, perfect example. Thank you for that. Uh, what didn't I ask you today that I absolutely should have about this very complicated topic that we've now unpacked and explained in half an hour. <laughs> well, I think one thing that, you know, uh, to tip the hat a little bit to your partners at Oracle here and, and our partners at Oracle as well, as well, you know, I do think that the technology space ar around loyalty has been evolving um, quite a bit. And what we in increasingly see is a recognition that delivering a membership experience that is truly market leading and omni channel. It's a full stack solution. What I mean by that is you can't look to a traditional loyalty platform to solve for all of the member experiences that you need to deliver. So uh, it raises a bunch of really sticky and good questions for brands to wrestle with in terms of their technology roadmap and where they're making their investments. And I have to just say one more thing. Where can people learn more about you? I really would love to highlight your five loyalty truths resource. And I will link to it at the smartercx.com article that I write after this. Um, but what else do, does any PK have anything else that it's promoting right now that folks need to know about? Yeah, thanks for asking that, Katie. Um, so there are a number of events that we have upcoming that you can find at pkglobal.com, uh, including a lot of our thought leadership and, and insights pieces around the loyalty space across industries. So we do take a very deep, you know, vertical or industry focused perspective around loyalty trends and best practices. And so for those of you watching who are interested in retail or banking or travel and hospitality or media and entertainment, definitely uh, go to those resources to get a double click view of what it looks like in your space. I love it. And, and Clay, the one big thing that I personally have learned from you, both in reading your stuff, talking to you now a couple of times, um, is that loyalty is an outcome, right? And the focus needs to be on the member experience, perfectly aligned to this show and everything that Oracle talks about with the experience economy. So thank you for helping us make sense of it. Much appreciated. Um, I really hope that uh, you come back on the show at some point if you've got some more great examples to share. Really enjoyed it, Katie. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Clay, and, and, and best of luck. Clay Walton House is the managing director at PK uh, and my favorite person to talk to about loyalty. So uh, you will be seeing more of him in the future. For now, I'm kicking you off, my friend. See you later. <laughs> I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Really, this topic is one of those that I think is only getting more and more exciting. Um, thank you again to our sponsors, Oracle CX and SmarterCX.com. Your last reminder that uh, nominations are due March 26th for the 15th annual Marquis Award. So don't miss your chance to be recognized if you've got a fantastic loyalty program that you are very proud of. Um, you can forget, uh, don't forget, you can catch all of today's recaps, all the resources we mentioned, uh, every link to everything Clay's ever written will be part of this blog post um, at smartercx.com. Uh, and as always, we end today's broadcast with 10 seconds of zen, uh, just to just to settle us all down in this chaos of, of 2021. This is a quick video from my birthday weekend last weekend. I went to the beach. We had an unseasonably warm day Day here in Boston and we we're just sitting there chilling and look at what came in the water which is this beautiful moment so I'm gonna play this for all of you and I want to thank you for joining us uh, for experience TV hope to see you next time uh, take care